New Scientist's award-winning journalism brings you the latest on science, technology, the environment and human health from across the globe, in print, online, in the app, on audio and video. This Christmas, discover the joy in learning new things every day with 50% off a digital New Scientist subscription. 50% off a digital subscription is an amazing deal. Go to newscientist.com slash halfprice22 to take advantage of this offer. Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly. This is the show that brings you a curated selection of the essential stories of the week. Our aim is to feed your curiosity. I'm your host, Rowan Hooper. And I'm Penny Sarche. Welcome to the show. This week, we're joined by new scientist journalists Leah Crane and Alison George, by science writer Michael Marshall, and by self-described Australian mammal nerd Jack (laughs) Ashby from the University of Cambridge. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Coming up this week, we've got news of the first complete map of the connections between the neurons in the brain of a fruit fly. And we're hearing more about how Mars, uh, that's the planet Mars, not the chocolate snack, how Mars has apparently active geology. I mentioned Australian mammals. We're going to be finding out about the mystery of the last Tasmanian tiger. And we're looking into the mirror with Adelie penguins and seeing if they can truly recognise themselves. But we're going to start with a people story. Uh, this is an extinct species of human, ancient human, called Homo naledi. Uh, Ali, this species was discovered sensationally about 10 years ago, wasn't it? And you've been reporting some new findings. Yes, this species was only discovered a decade ago in labyrinths of caves near Johannesburg in South Africa. Homo naledi is um, pretty small compared to us, with a strange mix of very primitive and modern features and a brain that's only about the third of the size of ours. Yet it seemed to be deliberately placing its dead deep into inaccessible caves, something that's actually a very complex behaviour. Yeah. And there, there was a question of how it navigated into these uh, dangerous and completely dark spaces. Yeah. So I remember reporting on this at the time, and there was there was massive excitement over this because the brain, as you say, it's so small, but you've got this really complex behaviour. So people thought we'd need to really reassess our understanding of, you know, what we expect from brain size and and cognitive ability if they're doing that with such a small brain Um, and the other thing as you say you know these caves really hard to get to pitch black and the team suggested at the time that the these ancient people used to use torches to navigate Mm, I remember Lee Berger talking about this at New Scientist Live a few years ago and and yeah just the torturous route to climb into these caves it was it was no easy feat Um, but can you remind me how long ago are we talking It's actually um, quite recently, this is something that's been cleared up since the initial discovery of the fossils. The remains have been dated to around 335,000 years ago to 236,000 years ago. Um, So that's when our lineage, uh, Homo sapiens, was evolving in Africa. And there were other Homo species around at the time. Tell us a little bit more then, like you say, we've been finding out more and more. What are the details of these caves? What were they like? Well, anyone with claustrophobia should uh, cover their ears now because they're an absolute nightmare to access. I was talking to Lee Berger about this at the weekend. One passage is only seven, just over 17 centimetres wide, and that's just one part of a nightmare wriggle you have to do to get inside the inside chambers. This means that only uh, very few small and slight researchers have ever got inside. But then in the summer... Lee Berger decided, he's the um, paleoanthropologist who uh, works on Naledi, decided he was going to try and get in. Despite being the wrong size, he was six foot two, um, he lost 25 kilograms in preparation. And in August, he managed just, it was such an epic to squeeze in and getting out was even worse. I, wow. This is astonishing, isn't it? Because there's been programmes about the the team that he had to recruit, all these small women that he got from around the world who were, you know, cavers, and they called them underground astronauts, you know, because, you know, you had to be really quite small to get in. I can't, it's amazing that he got in there, isn't it? Um, and out. <laughs> my God, yeah, and out. But so what did he find? Well, fire. Well, not actual fire, but evidence <laughs> of fire use everywhere. There was right. soot on the ceiling, there were hearths, there were burnt animal bones. So it seemed that this small-brained hominin was using fire not only to navigate but to cook down there, despite having a brain not much larger than a 
chimpanzee. And as you said, this is like adding to the evidence that we need to rethink what it means to be human because um, a lot of the sophisticated behaviours of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, such as uh, fire use and burying the dead, were thought to require a large brain. This is really is amazing stuff. I, I wonder about what it suggests about the use of the cave, because we were talking about it being a tomb before, right? But, you know, this burial chamber, but they were cooking in there. It made me think that it was a prison. <laughs> well, well, they went in there and they were cooking, but then they were dying in there because they, they didn't get out, did they? Or did they? I think they looked. I think they were deliberately placed there. It was like a, a like a sarcophagus or something, for, for as far as I understand it. But um, we'll just have to wait and see um, in future expeditions what turns up. Yeah, I was just thinking. Um, it kind of makes it all seem more intentional, doesn't it? Because I, I know when we were first finding out about this cave and the people there, it was kind of hard not to believe with these tiny gaps they were squeezing through. Maybe they just got lost and were trapped. But now that we know they weren't stumbling around in the dark, it suggests there's a lot more to learn about Homo naledi. Um, Lee Verge has always got something up his sleeve. Is, is there much more to come? Yes. I mean, he says that this fire discovery is just one of four major discoveries about Homo naledi, which will be coming out soon. The papers are in the process of being published. Um, He hinted at a talk last week of something possibly artistic. I'm guessing, this is just a guess, there could be gene sequencing. Um, All very exciting. Mike, uh, any speculation from you on what we might have there? I, I wondered if he might be there. Might be a, a mechanical computer. That he, <laughs> Dreaming that <Lee> there. <laughs> yeah, that's, gonna probably, that's probably optimistic because humans didn't humans didn't do that for a very long time. One of the things that's always striking about Neanderthals is, that although we sort of think about them as being not as clever as us, is that for most of our species, our two species' history, actually we were doing exactly the same kinds of things. The idea that Homo naledi might be doing anything artistic is is a really fascinating one, though, because just the idea that Neanderthals did that has been enormously controversial and has, t- and has taken years to establish. And there are plenty of paleoanthropologists who still don't believe it, despite what seems to me to be fairly cast iron dating evidence of the of the cave art. I am interested by the whole notion of naledi using fire, because on the one hand, it's not too surprising. There's evidence of much older fire use by other species but i would i do really want to see what burger's evidence is that this that the charcoal and whatnot that he's found in this cave actually has anything to do with naledi because i'm what i'm not clear about is whether or not it's actually been dated or whether how they can tell the age of it um they, they're in the process of doing this they've announced the discovery before the publication of the papers so yeah the firm evidence isn't well it, it hasn't been published yet Now that's the sci-fi alert, which means we're reporting on something in the news that's already been explored in science fiction. And Leia, this week, uh, well, it's about some very strange trenches on Mars in the Cerberus Fossae region of the planet. So what, what are these things? So Cerberus Fossae is made of these huge deep trenches. They're like 1,600 kilometers long. And we don't really know where they come from. We know that they're what researchers call extensional regions, which means that sort of the ground beneath them is ripping them apart. But for a long time, they've been very mysterious. And researchers might have just figured out what caused them, which is really exciting, especially because what they think caused them is something called a mantle plume, which is basically a bunch of hot rocks rising up underground from near the core of the planet, yeah, rising up towards the surface. Wow. So this is more evidence that there's an active geology, a like volcanic activity inside Mars internally. It's been said for a long time, isn't it, that, that Mars is dead geologically. So does this mean that the death throes of a planet go on for billions of years? And this is what the, like, the remnants of magma left from, you know, from back in the day. Basically, this isn't quite magma because it's still solid, but, you know, we knew that a planet dying took a really long time. We kind of thought that Mars was pretty much done because what we see in most places is that it's cooling down and the ground is shrinking, not expanding like in Cerberus Fossae. So this sort of hot rocks rising up was really a, a pretty big surprise we really thought it was pretty much geologically dead. But there's a lot of evidence for this magma plume pushing up the ground, heating things up. There's evidence in the gravity of Mars. There's evidence from Mars quakes. 
right. we're pretty sure that it is active. Uh, it's cheating a bit calling it magma plumes because I was going to ask you then, are we going to get magma bursting out <laughs> from on the surface of Mars, you know, like we do on Earth? So, But no, the answer is no. Well, the answer is yes, actually, um, because the plume itself isn't made of magma, but it is heating up the ground above it. So it is very likely that there is some magma motion on top of this mantle plume. Right. Um, and so we might actually get some volcanism, some effusive volcanism on Mars. Wow. The researchers told me it's not out of the question that in the, you know, geologically near future, which <laughs> okay. doesn't, you know, which means tens of thousands, hundreds hundred of million thousands years. Of yeah. years. <laughs> but uh, it's not out of the question that there could be active volcanism magma coming to the surface of mars i love that in the geologically near future um <laughs> I, I, we have to ask uh, this is good news for astrobiologists isn't it yeah basically any heat source is good news for for the idea of life and we have mantle plumes on earth in places like hawaii and the area above that mantle plume where things heat up can be a really good area for bacteria to survive because it can be an area where there's ice that's melted, where there's heat and interesting chemical things happening. So um, nothing obvious is standing out to me. Rowan, what's the sci-fi link here? <laughs> it is a bit tenuous um, because <laughs> when I heard about the, these trenches in the Cerberus Fossey region, I did think of those the old ideas from the beginning of the 20th century that there were canals on Mars. You know, the early astronomers saw these straight lines on the surface of the planet. And some people thought that indicated there was a civilization on Mars. Uh, but it, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. Uh, it turned out they were an optical illusion. Uh, the canals weren't even there in the first place. But these trenches are, and that's, that's going to be really interesting to find out more about them. And let's take a quick break. Are you looking for a unique gift this holiday? What about a gift that helps fight global warming? With Climeworks, you can now remove excess carbon dioxide from the air in the names of your friends and family. So Climeworks is the leader in direct air capture. That's a technology that removes carbon dioxide from the air. And once captured, it's stored underground using the carb fix method. And this is an accelerated natural process that turns carbon dioxide into stone, where it no longer contributes to global warming. So this holiday, choose the gift of climate impact at climeworks.com. And we're back and we have a big news story uh, in neuroscience. This is the largest complete map of a brain that has ever been made. Mike, you reported on this for us. Uh, what, what's the story? So this is the first map of the larva of the fruit fly, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, which is this tiny little uh, insect that has been used by biologists as an experimental animal for many decades. It, it's, it's central to an awful lot of genetics research, for example. So they haven't mapped the adult fly yet, uh, although apparently that is coming possibly quite soon. What they've instead mapped is the brain of the larva, of the maggot, essentially. So this is, this, is, this is a maggot brain. And as you say, it's the largest complete brain map that's been produced to date. So the first animal to have its brain mapped is this worm called uh, C. elegans back in the 1980s. And that has about 300 neurons in its entire body. The brain of this maggot has uh, 3,013. There have been larger brain maps, connectomes produced. There's a map of part of the human brain that has 50,000 neurons, but that's a tiny fraction of the human brain. So it's not the complete thing. The point about this is that it is actually the entire brain. So every, every single connection, every single neuron, all mapped out. So even though we're talking about what is a, a really tiny little maggot brain, it's still a huge undertaking, isn't it? Because every neuron is connected to one or multiple others. It's this whole sort of network effect. So I guess in doing this, they've, they've been able to sort of discover and explore quite a lot of things. And we'll link to your great story on this. But what jumped out at you the most from this kind of achievement? What, what have they found? There are a couple of sort of related things that all jumped out of me, which basically come under the heading of, wow, this brain is incredibly interconnected. So, for example, they found that a signal from sort of any neuron that you find will be able to make its way to pretty much any other neuron in the brain within sort of three to five hops. Um, mm. So even though there are these, you know, 3,000 neurons, if a signal wants to get from A to, you know, from one side of the brain to the other, it can get there very, very quickly. And there's just an enormous amount of interconnectivity. So the other sort of standout figure was that something like 50 odd percent of the neurons 
uh, we're receiving information from every different sense that the animal has and somehow combining all those different streams of information. And what that sort of points to is that although this is by comparison to something like a mouse, you know, a very simple animal and a very simple brain, nevertheless, it's it's not just sort of stimulus response, stimulus response. It, it is actually integrating lots of different kinds of information and using all those different bits of information to make decisions about what it does. It's a sort of window, a little, a little bit of a chink into the mind of this animal. That's really amazing. And I think it's quite easy to dismiss these tiny model organisms as kind of demonstration projects rather than things that are really informative. But increasingly, you know, we are sort of studying behavior in Drosophila, linking it to how their brains behave. And and that is telling us about how our own brains control our behavior and develop. So does it mean by actually fully mapping the whole brain of a young Drosophila and, and an adult one soon, Will we be able to explain all Drosophila behavior at, at a neural level? I mean, eventually, right, <laughs> hopefully. But is it, the comparison that everyone always makes when I talk to them about connectomes is that it's like when we, when the human genome was f- first mm. sequenced um, 22 years ago, and it was this huge data dump. And did that mean that we understood all of human genetics and human inheritance and genetic disease? Of course not. What it meant was that we had a data set to work on to try to start to make sense of that. So all the people who have been doing um, experiments where they sort of monitor like one single neuron inside the the Drosophila brain are now able to say, okay, well, that neuron that I've been working on for the last 15 years turns out it's actually connected to this, 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 and this. And so they can start to make sense of it within the broader functioning of the brain. And so ultimately, yeah, the idea is to sort of be able to say, oh, yeah, how is this particular behavior produced? How does the animal know to like move towards that um, food source while also steering clear of that um, nasty predator off, off to the right? But that was going to be a whole undertaking. Yeah, this, is, this is very much the start of something, not the, uh, not the finish line. But Mike, um, what about this idea that you, know, you get the connectome, you've got it digitally, you put it all on the computer, you press play, and bingo, you've got then a living digital life form. No. In, in <laughs> no, not now, but when? When are we going to okay. talk about science fiction? <laughs> that, that, is, that, is, that is definitely the science fiction alert going off in the background there. Um, okay. let's, let's start with the fact that um, although this is the complete, uh, complete connect, I mean, it's a complete map of all the synapses between the neurons, which are mm. connections where one neuron releases a neurotransmitter chemical and the other neuron sort of picks it up and detects it. There are other kinds of connections between neurons. So there are also things like gap junctions where two neurons are literally physically joined and uh, a little signal can pass between them. And this map does not include those. Uh, and there are also hormones and sort of other chemicals that the neurons sort of secrete that influence each other. And again, that's not mapped. So there's okay. three kind of there's almost there's almost three different kinds of connectome, and you need to know all of them <laughs> uh, in order to start making sense of this. So just having the synapses is essential, but it's not enough. And then there's just the fact that neurons are kind of individual you do need to know about the ways in which different neurons actually behave and respond to signals. So in the study, they sort of, they classified the neurons based on how they were, the sort of pattern of connections that they had and their, their morphology or their shape. And they found 90 different categories of neuron just within this larval brain. So each of those categories is now going to have to be studied to figure out what it's doing and how it's doing it. It's a nice start, but brain uploads are still, um, I think, some decades off. Sorry. Thanks, Mike. Um, no, that's inspired me to go and listen to the, the classic Funkadelic album, Maggot Brain. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for reminding me of that. That was science writer Mike Marshall. And Mike's book, The Genesis Quest, about the origin of life, is well worth a read. And next up, Penny, we've got self-aware penguins plotting to take over the world. <laughs> Well, I, I won't go that far. I wonder if they do a better job than, than we're doing. Okay, so uh, first off, I must say I'm not convinced by this experiment, but it involves penguins and mirrors, so I think we should talk about it anyway. Right, so this is the mirror test, isn't it? The, yeah. the classic test of, well, the supposed test of uh, self-awareness. Exactly. It's one of those really famous animal behaviour experiments. They developed it back in the 1970s. It essentially involves showing an animal their reflection and seeing if they can tell if it's themselves or if they think it's another dog or horse or whatever and and get confused. And so typically you might uh, put a mark on an animal's forehead or similar and see if they 
they're upset about it and try to rub it off. And you'd interpret that as, oh, they recognize themselves rather than thinking it's a new stranger. It's been tried on loads of animals. Uh, Some primates, dolphins, elephants, horses seem to have passed the test. Dogs don't usually. And I looked it up. Human infants apparently don't really recognize themselves until they're about 18 months older. Although (laughs) if you look into it, I'm actually quite skeptical about how, how possible it really is to sort of test that. Yeah, totally. But so what about penguins? And why are daily penguins? Oh, well, um, I'm not sure actually why the team picked a daily penguins. I wondered, Ali, have you, you've done a research in Antarctica. Have you ever encountered them? They're extremely cute, aren't they? I have. I do wonder whether it's a simply the researchers will buy some of these penguins. Also, they're quite um, friendly. They Well, they, I don't know if friendly is the right word. They will come up to you and they're quite curious, whereas some penguins don't want to come anywhere near, near you. So it might be they were just amenable. Who knows? So as our reporter Corinne Wetzel wrote this week, some researchers decided to try to apply this mirror test to summer dailies in Antarctica and they got mixed results. So the first step of the test, I think, is probably the most promising. Um, They basically showed a few penguins themselves in mirrors and the penguins sort of really seemed to inspect their reflections. They kind of rapidly moved their heads and flippers and bodies as if they were kind of seeing what they looked like when they did it. Okay, so it's just interesting and it's it's far from conclusive. Yeah, so you, you can't say that's conclusively proof that no. they're recognising themselves. The further steps were, I think, even sort of less convincing. So one was they stuck paper discs on the mirror so that the penguin could see their reflection but not their head. And the, the penguins didn't really like that and they pecked at it. But I think you would do that even if it was just a stranger. You don't necessarily think it's yourself. Um, you just want to see a face of the person you're looking at. And then in the final step, they put uh, coloured bibs, which sounds quite cute, on the penguins and then show them the reflections. And the, and the penguins showed no interest in, in investigating these bibs or, or removing them. No, they're probably quite warm in the in, bib <laughs> in Antarctica, weren't they? And wouldn't want to take it off. So it doesn't really tell us much, as you say. Yeah, I mean, because um, who are we to say that penguins would even find bibs interesting? <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe it just doesn't sort of uh, pique their curiosity. And I think that's um, that speaks to the broader issues with the mirror test and, and why it's so controversial, because it's one of these iconic tools for probing animal intelligence and consciousness. But it's often a very unnatural, contrived situation, and it can be really difficult to interpret how animals respond. So another one that that this called to mind was about six years ago, um, some researchers claimed similar with or tried similar with manta rays. And their study suggested that sort of circling in front of the mirror and blowing bubbles was were signs of self-recognition. <laughs> it's really hard to sort of look at fish and penguin behavior and, and draw a kind of direct parallel to human behavior. And yeah. it's all sort of based in this very human centric view of intelligence that we've come up with. Well, exactly, which is being challenged, as we heard with the, mm. the homo naledi story earlier from Ali. Still, I wish I'd tried holding up a mirror in front of a penguin. <laughs> you have to go back to Antarctica, Ali, and do it. Yeah, if someone will pay me, I'd love to go. So. Yeah. Right, we want to talk about a marsupial mystery now. Yes, this is the curious case of the last known thylacine, otherwise known as the Tasmanian tiger. Yes, the carnivorous marsupial, the one that went extinct. Yeah, so it went extinct and the remains of the last known animal, uh, they were lost for, what, 80 years or so and they've now been found. So to tell us about this, we're joined by Jack Ashby, who, as Penny said at the beginning, he's a self-described Australian mammal nerd. Um, He's the author of a brilliant book about Aussie mammals called Platypus Matters and he's the assistant director of the Zoology Museum at Cambridge University. Jack, welcome to the show. Uh, Tell us a bit about thylacines first, because they were amazing animals, weren't they? They certainly were. They were a proper icon of extinction. So they're kind of dog-shaped and dog-sized carnivorous marsupials, the largest carnivorous marsupials of modern times, which is astonishing because they have evolved to look, as I say, dogs and wolves have evolved to look pretty much identical despite being separated by 160 million years of evolution. But sadly, they were deliberately hunted to extinction. The last known animal died on the 7th of September in 1936 in a zoo in Hobart. And no one's knew what happened to that specimen. It's been long sought after because, of course, thylacines are stripy, so you can match, uh, you can identify individuals from their stripe patterns. And it had been thought that this last animal in Hobart Zoo had been photographed and filmed many times. So it's, it's it's an astonishing extinction story because it's, it's an animal that lived into basically into, modern, into living memory and was photographed and filmed extensively 
in zoos across the world. So there's photos in London Zoo, there's photos in Washington Zoo, and there's lots of footage in Hobart Zoo. And everyone thought that this animal in the footage was the last uh, known animal to survive. But it turns out in this research project at the Tasmanian Museum, Catherine Medlock and, and Bob Paddle have found that the last animal wasn't the one in the photographs, which is a, a kind of an interesting part of that story because we all of us who's written about thylacines have, have made that claim. Uh, and actually, yeah. the last one that died had been in their museum the whole time. So music, people have been looking for this specimen and it was in Hobart. And it's, it is brilliant because now we can point to physical remains. It's a skin and a skeleton and say that is the last known animal. It's, you know, we, we call the last known animal in a species an endling. And there's such a powerful connection to mm. stories of extinctions. We've got it for the passenger pigeon, got it for the Carolina parakeet. The endling. The endling. Wow. Which is, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's such a palpable connection to extinction. Yeah. And the remains hadn't been recorded because it was illegally trapped, right? So it just it was basically just knocking around the collection in the museum somewhere. Almost, almost, yeah. So it hadn't been recorded as arriving at the zoo as a live animal because it had been illegally trapped. But the reason it hadn't been recorded in the museum when it died is that because it, rather than going into what you might call the research collection, it went into the education collection because the zoo at this time was really poorly managed. It closed a year after the animal in the photographs that had died of mistreatment. It died of exposure. It was locked out of the inside part of its enclosure. And um, so it was, a, it was a poorly run zoo. That means that when it went to the museum, no data went with it. So the fact that where it was trapped when it was trapped, which is really important scientific data. The museum cared about those things. And so it thought it doesn't have that data. So we're not going to put it in the research collection. We're going to use it to teach school children around Tasmania. And so it went into the, into the teaching collection, only came into the research collection in recent decades. And so they just never, they knew, obviously they knew it was a thylacine. They knew they had it. And they just didn't know it was that thylacine. Right. By doing some brilliant archival sleuthing and a process of elimination of all their other thylacines, they've identified the endling. Yeah. You were telling me about this modelling study because, so it was so recent, you know, it was surviving in Tasmania, the thylacine, until it was wiped out by British colonisers. But you were telling me about this modelling study that suggests it survived in the wild until, well, really quite recently. It's absolutely amazing. So I've been to Tasmania many times in Philbrook and you can, you can never stop yourself from looking for thylacines, however much yeah. you think they're extinct. So the, as I said, the last known animal died in 1936, but no one seriously thinks that was when the species went extinct. It's just right. that's the last one we known can one. point to and say that's yeah. definitely a live thylacine right there. So everyone assumed most likely survived into the 60s or 70s. There was a very solid sighting in 1982 that a lot of people believe. But this study by Barry Brook at the University of Tasmania modelled the likelihood of every single sighting. And there have been thousands of alleged sightings. Most of them are going to be either mistakes or lies. Um, but he's, he's modelled how likely each of them were and put it through a very sophisticated statistical model and came up with the most likely extinction date in the 1990s or early 2000s, which totally wow. blows my mind. But I've yeah. not only been alive during the time the thylacines have been there, but I've been in Tasmania wow. uh, while the thylacines are alive. And that is kind of heartbreaking, but um, it's really amazing. It is, isn't it, that they might have clung on that recently. Well, what about bringing them back? I mean, because this has just sort of awoken all the ideas that people have about, you know, resurrecting it. What about the technical feasibility of that? So not really the moral or, you know, whether it's morally or ecologically the right thing to do, but what about technically? Is that going to be possible? Well, so the University of Melbourne have just been given a massive cash injection from a company called Colossal Biotech, who are also yeah. bent, bent on cloning the mammoth. And I mean, I, I do think the, the ethics of it are important. And I, I think it's, it is far too ethically challenging to, to attempt. But personally, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a genetic expert, but it, it seems utterly impossible. I, I cannot imagine that we will ever get past the genetic and technological issues there's so many steps involved and they're so difficult. We haven't even mapped completely the thylacine genome. It's about 4% missing and that 4% is hard to get. And it's a big difference. 4% is a lot of, of genetic uh, information. We've no idea, like the closest living relative of thylacine. In fact, thylacine is the only member of their family. So their closest relatives are collectively Tasmanian devils, numbats, yeah. quolls, antichinuses. The closest yeah. living, the animal they're going to use is a dunnar, which is about four centimetres long, thylacines are 20 <laughs> kilos. Gonna, you're going to gestate a thylacine <laughs> in one of those, are you? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. 
Now, Jack, um, before I let you go, you've written all about Australian mammals in your book, Platypus Matters. And I just want to get you to talk about platypuses a bit, because what an animal, uh, you know, egg laying mammal. Now, tell us tell us about the poison. The poison. Platypuses are absolutely astonishing. They um they get a lot of bad rep for being kind of weirdos, and I, I take exception to that. I think a lot all animals are weird, and we shouldn't point at platypuses. But their venom is remarkable. They've they have a cocktail of chemicals that have evolved into so the came the set the same toxins have evolved independently in animals like frogs, centipedes, snakes, spiders, sea anemones. Separate chemicals. Platypuses have combined every one into this cocktail of of uh, misery for anything that gets stung by a platypus. Uh, only male platypuses have them, have stings, and uh, they're only venomous part of the time of the year. So they're actually the only known seasonally venomous animals of any kind. Um, wow. If you're stung by one, the effects can last for 15 to 20 years. God. So avoid male platypuses in the breeding season. Wow, absolutely great advice. Great, thanks, Jack. <laughs> That's all for week thanks to our guest Leah Crane and Alison George and to special guests Jack Ashby and Mike Marshall and thanks to you for listening do help support our journalism by subscribing so you don't miss out remember that half price deal is at newscientist.com slash half price 22 and do tell everyone about our show and we'll see you next week bye bye, for now. bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.